Much of my speech earlier has focused on transforming and rejuvenating existing industries to future-proof Singapore's economy. I would now like to address another part of the equation, and that is how the government is working to nurture startups as catalysts of growth. Mr. Chow Chong asked about the government's efforts to build up our startup landscape. Now, startups play an important role in our economy. They help to boost Singapore's economic competitiveness through innovative ideas and disruption of existing industries, thus contributing to sector development and transformation. In recent years, we have seen good growth in the number, the contribution, and the quality of our startups. The total number of startups in Singapore grew from 22,000 in 2003 to 43,000 in 2016. They contributed 7.7 .7 billion Singapore dollars, or 1.9% of GDP, in 2016. In particular, the number of tech startups increased from 2,800 to 4,300 in the same time period, employing about 24,000 workers in 2016. Startups in Singapore are also attracting a good level of investor interest and funding. In January 2018, local logistics startup Ninja Van raised over 87 million US dollars in its Series C funding round, while late last year, Homegrown gaming company Razer raised 528 million US dollars in its initial public offering in Hong Kong. These success stories are certainly not one off. In Singapore, the venture funding activity and deal flows have multiplied significantly from 80 deals worth US 136.4 million in 2012 to 174 deals worth 1.37 billion US dollars in 2017. These developments reflect the growing quality and potential of startups here. This shows that our moves to distinguish Singapore's startup scene through establishing a strong brand quality, strong brand identity, I beg your pardon, strengthening our talent attraction efforts, and enhancing funding support are bearing fruit. Startup SG was launched in March 2017 as a single brand identity to showcase Singapore's startup ecosystem to the world. It also unified the government startup support schemes, making it easier for entrepreneurs to apply for support. Spring leveraged the Startup SG brand to organize the inaugural Startup SG competition, Slingshot at Switch, in September 2017. The competition attracted more than 900 teams from over 30 countries. Media coverage of the competition and the Startup SG brand was extensive and helped to increase global mindshare of Singapore as a startup hub. Second, to improve Singapore's attractiveness to global entrepreneurial talent, we enhanced Entropass's schemes entry and renewal criteria in August 2017. Since then, the number of applications has more than doubled. This is an encouraging development. Given Singapore's small size, we need to remain open to promising global entrepreneurial talent who can contribute to the vibrancy of our startup scene. This will help to seed future growth and good local jobs. In 2016, foreign startups generated a total of 9,800 local jobs. As a percentage share of the total employment generated by foreign startups, local jobs took up 54%, which contributes an increase from 50%, constitutes an increase from 50% in 2012. In one example, after Dr. Bert Groben's application for the Entrepass was supported in 2015, he incorporated a startup here called Budding Innovations. His company specializes in commercialization of technology by working with companies to develop go-to-market strategies. Budding Innovations has since created five local jobs, of which three are PMETs. Third, to strengthen funding support, we raised the cap and proportion of government's co-investment funding share under the startup SG Equity last year. This aims to capitalize private sector investment into promising Singapore-based technology startups with intellectual property and global market potential. Building on this, Spring appointed nine co-investment partners last month with the goal of further capitalizing over $200 million into more deep tech startups in the growth sectors of advanced manufacturing and engineering, health and biomedical sciences, and urban solutions and sustainability. Beyond funding, the deep tech startups will stand to benefit from the various resources and know-how provided by these co-investment partners, which, has been which had been chosen for their expertise 
in the respective sectors. This includes help with technology translation, prototyping and manufacturing facilities, and strategic networks for development and commercialization, thus working to shorten the startup's learning curves and improving their chances of success. To scale up, startups should seek out growth opportunities both locally and abroad. Startups can tap on partner networks which we have put in place. Last year, the government worked closely with partners like the Action Community for Entrepreneurship, ACE, to strengthen startups' access to smart financing and global networks. This included supporting the launch of ACE International Center, which provides a landing pad for global startups and helps local startups to scale up and internationalize. JTC has also developed launch pads at One North and Jurong Innovation District, JID, which offers a range of spaces for startups to operate and test bait their ideas. More importantly, launch pads serve as hubs to connect entrepreneurs with accelerators, incubators, venture capitalists, and fellow entrepreneurs in related fields. This creates opportunities for knowledge sharing, collaboration, and growth. At JTC Launchpad at JID, JTC will work with partners to provide a one-stop prototyping center where deep tech startups can leverage shared equipment for small batch production. Spring will also be launching the Startup SG Network later this year. The SSG Network will be a one-stop database of information as well as an e-community of startups and ecosystem players. This will support networking and facilitate business matching for startups. With the establishment of Enterprise Singapore ESG in April this year, startups will be able to leverage ESG's international network of offices and in-market partners to scale up and expand into new overseas markets. ESG will advise startups on capability development and internationalization while providing them with integrated support through the schemes that were previously under Spring and IE Singapore. As the Minister for Industry, Mr. S. Iswaran, had earlier highlighted, the government is adapting to better serve the needs of industry in Singapore's new economic environment. As part of this, government will restructure the Competition Commission of Singapore, or CCS, in April 2018 to take over Spring's current role as the administering agency for the Consumer Protection Fair Trading Act, or CPFTA. Besides the CPFTA, CCS will continue its current mandate of administering the Competition Act. To reflect its new role, CCS will be renamed as the Competition and Consumer Commission of Singapore, or CCCS. I would now like to address Mr. Lim Beltran's question about consumer protection for online transactions, specifically his suggestions to restrict the use of mandatory arbitration clauses in standard terms and conditions and pre-tick boxes for additional goods and services. Now, the CPFTA protects consumers against errant retailers which engage in unfair trading practices, regardless of whether these transactions take place online or offline. The Act provides for civil actions to be taken by consumers and by specified bodies against retailers that persist in unfair trading practices. The government adopts a balanced approach of supporting a pro-enterprise environment while at the same time protecting consumers. In line with the principle of freedom of contract, businesses are free to enter into consumer contracts as long as it is mutually agreed to by the contracting parties. Businesses and consumers should be alert to the clauses and conditions of any contract they enter into, including the fine print. Consumers should also take steps to protect themselves before making their purchases. This could include checking reviews on the reputation of retailers, as well as their refund policies and mechanisms. Practices such as using small print to conceal or mislead consumers on a material fact in relation to the transaction can be considered as unfair practices under the CPFTA. We note Mr. Lim's suggestions on arbitration clauses and pre-tick boxes. The government will study them and take them into account when we next review the relevant consumer protection legislations. We will continue to monitor the situation and take appropriate actions if necessary. As I have elaborated in my speech, the government has in place extensive support structures and initiatives to support our SMEs and startups on their transformation journey. What remains is for companies to step up and make the right investments today to seize new growth opportunities, not just for themselves, but also for a better future for all of us. Thank you.